Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's webinar for Let Him Go. Uh, we're going to give it just a few seconds to let everybody sort of jump in from watching the film. Uh, we have a great discussion tonight. My name is Meredith Kappel, and I'm the Senior Manager of Major Gifts at Film at Lincoln Center. And tonight we are so excited to present a live Q&A for Let Him Go featuring the film's writer-director, Tom Bazooka, and Dave Carger from Turner Classic Movies, who will be moderating. Uh, even though we know the New York Film Festival has ended, we encourage you all to continue checking out our virtual cinema as new program is being added weekly. Uh, we are currently featuring a collection of documentaries by Rob Epstein and Jeffrey Friedman, and tickets for Art of the Real are also now on sale. Uh, we want to take a quick moment to thank Focus Features for allowing us to screen this film for you, and of course, Dave and Tom, who are joining us this evening. Uh, also, we want to thank American Airlines, the official airline of film at Lincoln Center. And of course, lastly, all of you for your continued support of our work. None of what we would, none of what we do would be possible without your generosity. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dave and Tom for tonight's discussion of Let Him Go. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks so much, Meredith. Thanks, y'all. Yeah. Great to be with all of you at Film at Lincoln Center. And thanks to everyone who helped put this together and Focus Features, and especially to you, Tom, for giving us some of your time. We really appreciate it. It's great to oh, see yeah, you. Oh no, yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining us. I'm happy to talk to you. Full disclosure, Tom and I did one of these with uh, his three lead cast members, Kevin Costner, Diane Lane, and Leslie Manville last week and had a great time. So um, yeah. I'm gonna try to ask you some new questions, but there's a couple that I'm Good. gonna repeat just because some of your answers were so fascinating. Uh -huh. um, as, as many people may know, Let Him Go is based on a novel by Larry Watson. Uh -huh. I'm curious as to how the novel and you connected how did you find it? Did someone recommend it to you? And yeah. what was your connection to it? What did you find that made you think I had to make it into a movie? Sure, I found it on a bookshelf at the Barnes and Noble in the Grove. Um, but, and I picked it up because I recognized Larry Watson's name. And I had fallen in love with a book he wrote quite some time ago called Montana 1948. So I came to him as a fan and read the book and really responded to M Margaret and George, I think. And um, that's, and it was such a simple story that felt weirdly biblical and had these sort of Cormac McCarthy-ish things and was sort of a go gothic noir Western and I, I, I dug it. And then how, easy or hard was it to mount this? I mean, you've told me that there's lots of stops and starts in the film world, as we all know. Um, yeah. What were the biggest challenges in mounting it? And what, what went easy and what went hard? Sure, it, you know what, it, it's funny. Once we started, it was relatively easy. Um, I, I knew that this was a project we weren't going to be able to pick. I knew, I knew it was a modest size picture was the best way to approach it. And that it wasn't something you could pitch to a studio that I would, and it was so outside my, I think the, the sort of work that I'm, people think of me for that I, I wanted to write it instead of explain it. And so worked with, partnered with Paula Mazur and Mitch Kaplan, who I'd worked with on a previous project, the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society, which is a film Mike Newell directed. And we had just such a great time working together um, on that adaptation that I said, if you like, let's option this, I'll write the script and we'll take it out. And the, but the key was that I said, I'll do all that, but the agreement we're gonna make is it's period. George dies. And if you can, if you're okay, if you, if we can stick with that and they said, absolutely. So that was, and then I, I, it was, we were very lucky. I wrote a draft and um, while we were trying to figure out where, where we wanted to end up as a home, I, I was lucky enough to meet with Diane Lane and that made it easier. And we went to focus and Kevin came on and, it was, it was really smooth sailing from there. So that was the order of casting Diane and then Kevin and then Leslie? 
That's right. Wow. Yeah. 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 And listen, much has been made, as you well know, because we even talked about it when I had you all on the Zoom last week. Much has been made about the fact that it's, you know, Kevin and Diane reuniting after playing Superman's parents in, yeah. in two movies. Did that matter to you? Was that of special interest to you? Like, oh, they have a, a shorthand, they've worked together, or did it not really make a difference? It, it didn't make an, a, a difference. It's, it's funny. I, I sort of, I think, um, you know, I'm not, I wasn't the person to, who thought of putting peanut butter and chocolate together, but I'm smart enough to know they taste good. And I'd seen them do a junket, a little mm. video junket for one of the Superman movies. And I just, I love their rapport and they, they felt easy with each other um, and, and a little frisky and funny. And I really responded to that. And, you know, it's, it's, I had not credited how much people identify them as a couple with that, the Superman movies. I, I think it would have given, I would have done it anyway, but I think it would have given me more pause had I known what a, um, the whole fan world that pre-exists. Right. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a, a, a uh, now it may be a little bit of an innocent, simplistic question, but I did mm -hmm. notice that Kevin Costner also has an exec producer credit on the movie. Is that just part and parcel of bringing someone on of his caliber or did that make a material difference in like the pre-production? Did he help with specific things behind the scenes too? I think it, it helps in a number that, you know, they're sort of, it's not, it's not credibility so much as it is. I think it, he it brings a certain muscle to, to the party that um, helps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the reviews have really focused on the fun of seeing Leslie Manville, yeah. you know, this fabulous British actress Oscar nominated for Phantom yeah. Thread, as I'm sure this audience well knows, especially, yeah. and also all the Mike Lee movies that she's done over the years right, in right. this in this American role. And when we talked last week, she said it was the first time she'd ever done a U.S. accent on film. Of course, she'd done yes. it on stage, Long Day's Dreaming yeah. Tonight. Um, that was a bit of a leap of faith, though, to cast her. And yeah. I, it really paid off because a lot of people are talking about her performance. What, what gave you the confidence to bring her on in this role, besides the fact that she's a phenomenal actress? Well, she's a phenomenal actress. <laughs> you just answered it. She's a right. phenomenal actress. The, you know, I, I want to give all credit to um, A.B. Kaufman, our casting director, who always had, Leslie was number one on her list from the moment she read the script. And I think that there were, there, the reason we didn't go to her sooner was I th there was a school of thought that the Blanche character had to be played by an American actress. Um, but I was a, an ardent fan of Leslie's from all the Mike Lee work. And then of course, uh, Phantom Thread and, and Focus loved her because they had, they'd done Phantom Thread. Um, so we got to a point where we could make that offer and, and I talked to her on the phone and she was so great. Um, and I was, you know, I'd heard the accent. I'd seen some clips from her work on uh, Long Day's Journey Tonight. And as I said the other day, I, I knew, I trusted her enough that if she didn't think she could do it, she would let me know. Um, and, and I think she did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, we talked a little bit about this before, and one of the things I really admire about this movie mm -hmm. is how spare the script is. And mm. I mean, just thinking of the moment when, um, uh, when it's discovered that the, ba the, the family is gone, you know, there's no, James is gone. There's no, there's no hysterics. Everything is, everything between Diane and Kevin is done with a look or yeah. a gesture. Mm -hmm. um, and I got the sense that you took cues from the book as far as that's concerned, but was it mm -hmm. a challenge for you in the writing of it to keep it that way and not to you know, add more yeah. lines and, and trust that you could have your actors get yeah. everything across in a look or a gesture? Yeah, um, it, it's, a, it's a great question. And, those, and so many of those scenes that have, the scenes that have virtually no dialogue are, are, are inevitably the ones that please me most as a writer, <laughs> strangely. Um, that um, 
it, I did lean on the book for, I, I loved how how spare and they don't talk much. And so you sort of lean in when they do. Mm. Um, I, I love that scene. Well, it, it's a, the thing. I love that. I loved writing that scene. I loved figuring it out that she makes that cake and he wants some icing. And she says, that's not for you. What is not in the movie is a scene we shot in between, which is they're sitting at that kitchen table having dinner hmm. and he's talking about, um, he just mentioned something about trying to find work for Donnie and she just uh, she doesn't say anything she's just mm. and she's keeping a secret and i loved it came out early because you, you they're so good and you understand the economies you get from their performances but i loved um i just i love that she didn't say anything that it was, and and the, it feels that there's a lot of that in the movie that they can just give each other a look or yeah um, when he buys the when he buys the bottle of scotch Oh. And she, you know, they don't look at each other. They, they never look at each other in that scene. And I love that. Well, think of all the movies where there's been conversations. You drink too much. No, I don't. And you, you get all of that across with just, with just a look. I also love the moment where, he's, where she's tying his tie. And oh, it's one of my favorites. Oh, my God. And then the scene that the, the, and then we did a take when Kevin put his hand over hers. And, I, and it, uh, that really got me. I loved it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, um, yeah, I want to tell people that anyone who's watching this, if you have a question for Tom, please put it in the chat um, and I will be glancing at them and I'll ask Tom some of your questions. So please don't be shy, any of you who are, who are watching. Um, one thing that I asked you about last week, and I would love for this audience to hear your answer as well, is how you went about achieving the scene outside the grocery store with, uh, <laughs> you know, given the fact that you had physical abuse, a very yeah. young actor. You had two twin boys playing that toddler part, but you did it in a really interesting way. Yeah, it was, um, we had twin boys, Otto and Bram um, Hornberg, and, and their mother, Jody, who, uh, the person that was most traumatized by that was me. Um, I did not want to, I was terrified I was gonna harm this child. Um, the, the strategy was actually the, it's an in-camera trick where Will Britton, who plays Donnie, just in slow, it's almost slow motion, just at natural speed sort of reaches his arm and only places his fingers on the kid's cheek. And then we ramped it up. Um, we accelerated the frames. Um, and so it's, it looks like he lashes out. The What happened though was Donnie or Will and Kaylee, who played Lorna, they did sort of work out some choreography about her getting hit. And just Otto watching that a couple times really freaked him out about being near Will. And we kept explaining it's pretend, but by the time Will was sort of coming at him with an ice cream cone, Otto, <laughs> I'll be down the street. Um, so, Anyway, so that's the way we did that. But it was, it was, that's an interesting scene just because it's Diane in front of the grocery store. We shot in front of a grocery store, but what was across the street from the grocery store, I did, we couldn't use. So it's actually two blocks over oh. that you have what she sees. So it, it was complicated to do, but it was, I hope it's effective. You would never know. Yeah. Um, so in a case like that, just so that I understand it, are, is it a combination of you as a director, you know, having a conversation with these two young actors so that they understand, and, and, and Will, yeah. your older actor, explaining, or do you also rely on the, the mom, the, the actor's mom who's on set? It, it was definitely, it, it, was, it was a partnership all the way around. And I didn't want to do anything that she was not comfortable with. Um, and, and I relied on her to understand the kids limits of tolerance um but the other thing was you know the in the script it's it's scripted as you see it but i definitely did i was careful i wanted it i wanted to it to be margaret's experience of seeing it so 
I didn't want to be across the street, like a close up of Donnie slapping the kid. It, what mm. you see is Margaret's perspective. It's through a windshield and across the street so that I didn't, I didn't want to lean into it too much. Well, it feels like something that nobody was meant to see. It feels That's like right. something Margaret yeah. wasn't meant to see, and it's something that we as an audience weren't meant to see with with the distance. So that's yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. power of it and the shock of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um you also I also learned from Leslie that because no, actually Kevin was the one who wanted it known that mm-hmm. Leslie basically arrived in Canada where you filmed oh. this in Calgary, yeah. like yeah. the night before or the day before she had to start shooting. Yeah, no, it was it was terrifying, and and I want to give a shout out to Paula Mazer, our producer, who really fought to make it happen to get Leslie there. We only had, I mean, we had Leslie shot three days. That was it, and we had her for or we she she shot sorry she shot eight days, and we had her for ten, and then had to return her to England. So. She arrived in a snowstorm, flying from England, went directly from the airport. I met her at the hair and makeup trailer to introduce her to Blanche. And, <laughs> and then she and I went and had dinner. It was like, do you, I'm sure you want to go to your hotel. And she's like, I'm a little hungry. And I was wow. like, <laughs> and, and then we shot, we had rehearsals all the next day of the motel scene. And then we started shooting the dinner table the next day. So she, wow. she is, I mean, she's just aces, but it's like she, you know, she's like a paratrooper. She, you know, flew in and hit the ground running. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, and Kevin I, really admired that. I could tell. Yeah. Um, yeah. This dovetails nicely with a question from Irene Richard, one of the audience members. Did you shoot it in Montana and North Dakota? What were the locations? Well, it does really, I was surprised to learn that no, you didn't shoot it there. So explain where you, where you did shoot we it. We didn't. We, you know, for the inevitable tax purposes, we went to, we went to Canada and we, to, in order to, we were all over Alberta province. Um, and there's sort of, we were in, based in Calgary, and then a number of cities like Fort McLeod, where they actually, you know, we shot in the the apartment that Lauren and Donnie move into is the is the, the apartment Heath Ledger's apartment from Brokeback um, in the town of Fort McLeod, which is a plane. I knew line. that. I huh? told upstairs yeah. where she talks to the neighbor. Yeah, it looks. Oh wow, that's wild. That's, it. that's no, and the living room where Lauren is showing her around. That and the kitchen. That's the apartment. That's hilarious. That makes it, yeah, sense. no, it was it was pretty cool. Um, but we but that's sort of a plumb line to Helena, Montana, and then you go across Alberta and you're above North Dakota. So it's it's the same terrain for the most part. You're just it's like an hour, two hour difference north. Um, Irene's following up like a good reporter should, yeah. um, asking about the Badland scenes. Those weren't those were Canada too, not North Dakota. That's right. The, um, we're mostly, and Irene can, um, you can see more of these locations in the reboot of Ghostbusters, which was oh. hot on our, t- like, we would leave town and they would roll in. Um, oh. But the, it, the Badlands, where they're on an overlook looking out, that is above the town of um, Dor- Dorothy. It's a, yeah, and the it, which is just outside of Drumheller, okay. In and it's the dinosaur capital of the of North America. Wow. Yeah. Um, now, because I'm a host on Turner Classic Movies, I uh, okay. I've been very intrigued because several of the critics have compared your movie to The Searchers, which makes yeah. sense. Um, you know, thematically and the look yeah. of it. Are you a John Ford fan, a Natalie Wood fan, a John Wayne fan? Were you, were you looking toward, to that movie or did you find similarities in Larry Watson's book that intrigued you that? Um, I am a huge John Ford fan and a fan of The Searchers. And we actually built Peter's, the Peter Dragswolf's cabin so that the door, there's a doorway and you see him walking the horse away through the frame of the doorway. And that was a little- The nod. last shot? 
there you go. That was a nod. Um, but you know, the thing I one of the things I so admire about John Ford is he how many silent movies he made yeah. um, previous to you know his long career and the one of my favorite movies is How Green Was Your Valley and the use of objects to tell a story and you know mm. there's a scene of or there's a shot of the kitchen sink in this that I love because that's the sink she was washing the baby in. And of course that's where she's standing. And so whether it means anything to anybody else, I don't, it mean, it meant something to me. Okay. Are there other examples of, of classic films that you're nodding to here? Um, you know, I think that there's a, um, I'm sure there are, it all sort of goes in, doesn't it? Um, but I, I did, part of the approach when I was talking to Guy Godfrey, the director of photography, was I, I, I wanted to make the movie using whatever tools would have been available sort of in the late 70s that I didn't want to do. There are no drone shots. There's no, it's all, there was something to me about Margaret and George's story that had sort of about them that had this sort of homemade handmade aspect and this integrity kind of and so like with the drive the car driving I wanted all of that to be practical and so and all of it is except for the very very end um, but in mostly it's Guy and Craig the focus puller and I in the back seat with Kevin and Diane and it just felt truer to me to do it that way. I love that. Yeah. Um, what about wardrobe? I mean, you have uh, mm. Carol Case, this fabulous customer who, yeah. who has worked on the TV show Fargo. So she knows the area, right? Um, yeah. were, did she, did she make things? Did you find vintage clothes for your characters? Yeah. Was it a mix? It was a mix. One of the, um, uh, we actually made everything, virtually everything Diane wears. There's maybe one dress, or two dresses that are vintage. Um, Kevin, we did a thing. I loved working with Carol. She was great. And with Kevin, I wanted to do, I, I didn't want this family, it, this is really weird, but um, I, I just wanted him, he's, he's a former lawman and I wanted, he's not in blue jeans, which he would be. I wanted you to always feel the ghost of a uniform about him. Mm. So he's, he's wearing tan and brown a lot. Um, and mm. with Blanche, I just, you know, we made this dress for her for when she appears. I wanted to make the dress the same color as the background so you couldn't really see her. And there's a print on the dress that is, um, this matchbox I had had a pull a Polish matchbox that had a flaming match on it. And so I just like the idea of her being on fire without you well, really knowing it when you first meet her. And Leslie even said that in her mind, Blanche was the kind of woman who wanted to look like the blonde bombshells from the movies that she grew up watching, like in the thirties and forties. She definitely had, and, and, and there's a little bit of it in the, there's sort of a, a whiff of it in the book, I think, but I think she was right, and I totally dug it, that Blanche, 30 years earlier, had 40 years earlier, had really traded on her looks mm -hmm. and a sex appeal. And she's she still believes that's a tool that is effective. Am I correct that the very first time we see Blanche She's kind of standing behind the lamp over the table, and then she. Yeah. You, what that was fascinating. How did you come at the, that, the way I, that we would? That do? was I, I. I don't know how I came up with it. It was an idea I had, and there, there's actually a shot. In, it's from a still I had of, from in East of Eden, where the family is at a table under a lamp like that, and I just love the idea of her being obscured. You couldn't see her, and that they walk in like she's a spider in her nest and i liked the weird and she's also set this stage for them like she's a performer and they come in and she's standing in right in front of them but they can't see her until she reveals herself um i like, I like that, that. 
Yeah, and East yeah, of Eden. Yeah. Okay, you got another. That's another example of a. There you go. Stage well, there's a real kind of East of Eden colorway, I think. Oh wow! So Joe right. Van Fleet. I mean, that's like a great yeah. parallel to Leslie Manville, this like fabulous, you know, right, largely right. stage actress doing a great film thing. Um, yeah. I want to ask you a question that I asked Kevin last week, and if we had more, if we had had more time last week, I would have asked you to answer it then. But now I mm. just have you. So yeah, um, I, I'm very intrigued by the fact that this movie takes place in. 1960 early 1960s mm. um yeah. and largely because it heightens the mystery like they uh they can't find the wee boys by typing on their computer right. and googling them or you know calling someone on a cell phone so it helps the story but mm -hmm. how else do you think the time frame the period time frame it's crazy to think that 1960s period but it's 2020 um oh. how what does that add to the film in your mind? What, what I, it, it's a, a great question. I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about it because the, the book is set in 1951. And I, in a really early conversation, I mean, I, there were a couple things I did. I also reversed the course of their journey in the book. They're, they live in North Dakota and they go to Montana. And when I first talked to Larry Watson, I just sort of wanted his blood. I wanted to let him know and wanted his blessing um, about changing the time. The more I sort of drilled down on the characters, there was sort of in the 1950s, there was still like, if you do, if I had to do the math for the men in the movie, there was, there were questions about their service in world war two. It's still 51 is still sort of post-war. And then I had the idea of 63 and that, you know, Kennedy is president and it's not going to end well. It's, this is, these are the last days of American innocence. And that sort of did it for me. Wow. Yeah. You don't see it in the, in the scene in the, when they get married, but there, there's a picture of Kennedy on the wall. Oh, okay. Okay. That's, that puts yeah. a fine point on it. I was taking my cue from the Buddy Holly and the crickets. Oh boy. You yeah. Know? So how did you, yeah. How did you choose that as kind of the emblematic, you know, early sixties? Well, you want, it, you know, it was, it was fun to figure out all that stuff. It was what you, what we had to do with the cars and the clothes and the music is figure out what, what, what the lag time is in 1960 for Montana in 1963. So it would have taken a few years to get that song. Like, exactly. so their, like their station wagon is a 58 Chevrolet. So I, I, what I was saying is, oh, I think they bought it when Lauren and Donnie got married. Like, we're going to be a family. We need another car. So that's where that car came from. Um, so, but the, the crickets, well, the song was just so, it was all about boy, you know, my oh, boy and all that. All so stuff that was perfect. But it's, it's also like, I, I, anyway, it's, a, it's not very interesting. If this isn't interesting to anybody, I'll be fascinated. But um, the, I liked, I didn't want the first song in the movie to be a country western song. I wanted it to be, you know, they weren't in, they were contemporary enough for their time. Right. That it was, you know, it wasn't Doris Day or it wasn't Hank Williams. By the way, this is film at Lincoln Center. I think I think they care. I yeah, know. Good. I know. I do. Okay, uh, spe good. Speaking of the music, you have an Oscar-winning composer, Michael Giacchino. Yeah. yeah. I mean, who's who's known for doing a lot of the Pixar movies. Yeah. Um, he did a great job here. He really adds a, a real sense of drama, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's fraught. You know, the yeah. menace, the menace of it. Yeah. How, what were your conversations with him? Um, well, it's, I'm just blessed. It's the third time I've worked with Michael. Um, oh. We did The Family Stone together oh. and we did Monte Carlo, the uh, Selena Gomez movie. And the Monte Carlo score is one of the things I'm most proud of because I, the studio did not dig what we were doing. Um, but it's a whole Henry Mancini kind of riff. And, oh. and Michael did such a great job. This was great because it was different for both of us. Like I hadn't, you know, I haven't done a Western and he had, it, you know, he's scored all sorts of movies, but he'd never done a Western either. And, you know, we looked at, he's just, he can do anything. But, um, you know, I like these sort of 
soft Stephen Foster melodies that he has. Um, but then he did these sort of sickening soundscapes in the motel and with very few instruments. And mm. I love that there's something in the score in that motel scene early on where when it's right around, it's when Margaret says that Donnie had hit Lorna. And it's sort of, and it's when it gets very quiet and still between Blanche and Margaret. And there's this guitar thing that sounds like whale songs. And it's mm-hmm. just, it's, it's really, it's primordial. I love it. Um, we have a couple questions from uh, people who are watching about some plot points, particularly, um, you know, near the end. And, and I do think, and I also want to ask you about yeah. sticking to your guns about having the movie end the way it did. So here, yes. Leslie Putani, I love her question. Wasn't losing his hand enough, she says. Why did George have to die? Was that in the book tragic? Uh, it is in the book. It, that whole sequence in the end is sort of alluded to in the book, but not seen. Um, I always felt, you know, they go to hell to get the boy back. One of them has to stay in order to save him. And George, it was the moving thing to me in the book. Like, he, what's he going to do? He's got one hand now. Like, this, this, this he can do. He knows Margaret is, like, she's crazy now. He can't. So it's... This, this he can do. Okay, did you, ha- and at any point in the whole pre-production of this movie, did you mm-hmm. ever have any pushback from any executive or actor you talked to like, well, we would really like it if it was a happier ending. And you know, it's, it's, it's funny it, this is, I, not to tell too many tales out of school, but the, I had gone to a meeting. We did pitch, I did pitch it once with another producer. Mm-hmm. Um, at one point and years ago and the executive that we met with said well it seems awful sad like could he like does the grandfather have to die and the producer was like tom I, i've been meaning to tell you ask you about this and i just and it's why the agreement i made with paula and everybody was like here are the conditions and i just felt like it was true to the story it was true it was in the book and um, it, and it's, it, you know, it's a little bit about it's how far you'll go and the, the, there are consequences to these mm-hmm. things that it's, if it, if it had been a happy ending, what's that? I think. But, and it seems like Kevin Costner was totally on board with that and adamant. Yeah. And, and it, I, I mean, I really want to be clear, like there was nobody ever associated with this production that thought, oh, maybe he could, maybe it's a good idea to make him live. Everybody was like, and, and Kevin, I mean, I think, yeah, no, it was, it was never a question. A um, couple last things with the few minutes I have left, and I want to remind the people that are watching, if you have questions for Tom, you, it's not too late. You can still type them in the, in, in the little chat here and I'll, I'll, I'll ask them for you. Um, what has it been like for you over the last few months, this was a movie that was supposed to come out in August, of course, with the way the world is, it's now coming out now in this crazy time. Are you fine with it being a fall movie as opposed to a summer movie? Did you care one way or the other? Uh, I, I don't care. I, 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 I don't care. I always thought it would be a good Mother's Day movie. Um, mm. But um, I, th- my only disappointment, the only part that stings at all is not being able to watch it in an auditorium with 300 people. I know. Yeah. I've watched it twice now and it's, you know, it's on my computer and or yeah. my TV streaming from my computer and it looked great. But I did think, especially with some of the fantastic, you know, landscape. Yeah. And, so, and also but who doesn't want to watch like Kevin Costner and Diane Lane big? Yeah. I like, an, I like audiences. I like audiences. I'm sure. Have you ever watched this movie with an audience? Well, we did this is part of my disappointment. We only got to, we watched once with a, we had one test screening over a year ago in LA. Mm. And I've never, I was shocked at how people, the bloodlust of the audience for the cheering when Bill got killed. And I thought, 
that really? And then when Blanche, they went nuts when Blanche got shot. And okay, so it was it was a fun surprise for me. You can't cut off Kevin Costner's fingers and not ex- have the audience like yeah, 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 not root yeah. against you dying. So yeah, um, yeah. And then finally, we we touched on this a little bit, but I mean, it's kind of a silly question, but it's also a serious question. I mean, you've directed very impressive actors. You know, Diane Keaton was in The Family Stone, Sarah Jessica Parker. But what is it like as a director when your star is an Oscar-winning director? Yeah, yeah. Is it, I mean, did, did Kevin Costner ever, like, at, you know, ask, ask to give input? Did he ever give input? Did you ever ask for input? Or what were the, were the lines really delineated? He, he, and I, here's the thing. I, I think he's, he is so respectful um, and... It, 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 it's interesting. I, I feel like he's a, like an honest workman and I'm here. This is the job I'm here to do. This is what I'm going to do, which doesn't mean I'm not asking him um, for thoughts. And he, but then he also like, you know, dude, you, you did, like we're in the motel room and it's like, you got like, he's been in a hundred fights in movies. I want everything. Every, I want every idea he can come up with. And that's, you know, but it's, it's sort of the joy of, I love collaborating with actors. Um, and if you get, yeah, here's the thing about Kevin is he, I, I think he just let me direct the movie. Kevin is inherently a storyteller hmm. and that does not stop. And you definitely want to, like you're remiss if you're not engaging him on that level, for sure, for sure. Well, it's such a fascinating movie. I love it. Yeah. I'm, it's such a pleasure to talk to you again, Tom. And we should tell this film at Lincoln Center crowd that you're on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. So you're kind of in that vibe. I'm so, thousands of yeah. miles away, but I'm a part-time Manhattanite. I'm okay. just not there right now, but I'm, yeah. I'm sending New York all my love. Yeah. And I also say congratulations to you again, Tom yeah. Bazooka, um, on a wonderful film. And uh, again, thanks so much for taking oh, some time. Oh, thanks for doing this. It's so, not, it's so great to spend time with you again. It was an absolute pleasure. And thank you again to Film at Lincoln Center and Focus Features for helping to put all of this together. Um, and I, without, I'm going to say, ha- everybody have a good night and try not to watch too much news. <laughs> yeah. Good deal. Good deal. Take care, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye.